Uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, and thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I think I'm probably on the same pathway as you as far as financial literacy is concerned, and I'm still learning to this day, which is why I'm so passionate about it in schools as well, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. But Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge Jane Wrightson as our Retirement Commissioner. It's great to see you again. I met Jane recently and just love um, Jane's openness and frankness and to tell it as it is. And I know I've got lots to learn from you too in that space. But also to the financial capability community. Uh, you're doing amazing work to provide New Zealanders with financial education and information to make better use of money. In my role as Minister for Women, I'm committed to helping make a positive impact when it comes to women's financial confidence and well-being. In fact, uh, this is something that has really impacted on me in my role and how we can do better. It's great now to have the Minister for Women sitting around the Cabinet table. That hasn't happened for quite some time and it does make a difference when we're talking about these areas and I can always ask the question, hey, but what about women? What are we doing to think about how we're making lives better for them? So today I do want to speak about shifting the dial for women and what, it, what we're currently doing in this area and also what I believe needs to happen and the work plan that we've got in front of us at the moment. Now we know that women have a different experience in the world of work than men, and this difference usually means that they are economically disadvantaged. Manatu Wahine, the Ministry for Women, estimates that on average women earn $888,108 less over their lifetimes than men. Now let's just take a moment to digest that, nearly $900,000. Now. I recently had a bilateral meeting with the uh, Prime Minister for Japan's Chief Advisor on Women, and she asked about this gap, and I said that figure out loud for the first time, and then I started to think about that as I'm having this meeting, and thought, I've got that wrong. That can't be right. I've got that wrong. And afterwards, I said, turned around to my officials after the meeting and said, I'm so sorry, I got that wrong. Because when I said it out loud, it absolutely hit me how big that figure is. And to which they turned around and said, no, you haven't. That's exactly the figure of where the difference between men and women are. As I said, I'd read it so many times, but saying it out loud had the real big impact on me. It reflects our different employment pathways, different work patterns, time out of the workforce, pay equity issues, and occupational segregation. There are also many big financial decisions women make in life. We need to ensure that all women have access to the information and support they need to make those decisions. If we, as a society, address these inequities and empower women to improve their financial capability, we know that this can make a big difference to families and communities. So unsurprisingly, when you are paid less, this impacts on your retirement savings. Research released recently, and I'm sure you've heard it here already, by the Retirement Commission showed that an astonishing 20% gender pay gap in the retirement savings between men and women. This gap or imbalance is widest between men and women in their 40s and 50s. And while the imbalance is large, it's hardly unsurprising and unfortunately unsurprising. The retirement savings gap is closely associated to trends in the labour market. Women have different employment journeys to men, and the retirement savings gap refl reflects this. In particular, the combined impact of gender and ethnic pay gaps. Time out of paid work, such as due to motherhood, child rearing or study breaks, and the higher percentage of women working part-time. And research from Kiwi Wealth released earlier this year also highlighted that a key driver behind the savings gap was low confidence and knowledge of investing in KiwiSaver among women. This government is working to support women's financial well-being. To achieve this, we need to address employment inequities, and we need to enable and support women to have financial capability and confidence and knowledge. Now, an important step, one that I'm really proud of, to shifting the dial for women is to address, address the employment inequities they experience. So, I launched Te Mahere Fai Mahi Wahine, the Women's Employment Action Plan, on the 30th of June 2022 in South Auckland.
Now, when I came in as Minister for Women, there were already six employment action plans in train to address other population groups. But women didn't have their own employment action plan or one that was being developed. And when I asked why, I was told that they would be reflected in each of the other employment action plans, to which I stated I do not want to be a tick box in anybody else's action plans. I have issues that are pertinent to me because I am a woman. And so, therefore, we now have a Women's Employment Action Plan. Success Area 1 of the plan is focused on ensuring that women are financially secure. I am committed to ensuring that women are paid fairly and equitably for their work. The actions under this success outcome focus on structural labour market reforms, pay transparency, pay equity, implementation of fair pay agreements and closing gender and ethnic pay gaps. By addressing these issues, we will go a long way to ensuring that women are fully recognised and valued for the work that they do. So pay equity aims to ensure women and men receive the same pay for the work that is different but of equal value. The pay equity assessment process looks beyond the task someone is doing to understand the pro properly and properly value their work. Since the first pay equity claim settlement in 2017, six more claims have been settled, and over 100,000 workers from female-dominated workforces have benefited from these settlements, with pay corrections at an approximate average rate increase of 33.4 per cent. It's a long time that these women haven't been paid of equal value, and it's great to see that we're addressing this and correcting this now. There are 24 pay equity claims in progress, with more expected to be raised in the coming months. And it is important that private sector employers engage in this work to uphold the rights in the Equal Pay Act and ensure gender and ethnic pay gaps are closed across the whole economy. Just recently, I met with a group of women from a female-dominated occupation in the private sector who are exploring taking an equal pay claim. And I'm heartened that the changes to the Equal Pay Act that our government has ushered through will make such claims more straightforward. If there is a situation of inequity, then it needs to be fixed. Te Orawaru, a gender-neutral work assessment tool, was released in 2021. The tool recognises cultural skills, particularly factoring te ao Māori and cultural competency that wahini Māori bring to their work beyond their job descriptions. Te Orawaru can be used to assess work in the pay equity process. Guidance is currently being developed to allow this tool to be used more broadly as a job evaluation tool adaptable for all sectors. Gender pay caps are complex, and while achieving pay equity is a key step, it is not the whole solution. There is a persistent gap in pay between men and women, and it is not equal for all women. The 2022, released last week, gender pay gap is now at 9.2% overall, up very slightly from 9.1% in 2021. The figure is much higher for Māori, Pacific and Asian women and women with disabilities facing intersectional discrimination. Approximately 20% of the gender pay gap in Aotearoa New Zealand can be accounted for by differences between men and women in education, occupation choice, age, type of work and family responsibilities. The remaining 80% cannot be easily explained other than by behaviour, attitudes and assumptions about women in work, including unconscious bias and discrimination. 80%. While this gap has been closing over the last 20 years, it has been stagnating, and COVID hasn't helped that situation either. And while Māori, Pacific and Asian and ethnic pay gaps are trending down, far more needs to be done to accelerate this reduction. Last year, I launched Kia Toi Poto, the Public Service Gender, Māori, Pacific and Ethnic Pay Gap Action Plan for 2021 to 24. Kia Toi Poto recognises that we can't close gender pay gaps unless we address ethnic bias and discrimination. And we can't close ethnic pay gaps unless we address gender bias and discrimination. The two are absolutely, completely linked. Until this pay gap is at zero, there is more work to be done. We are making good, uh, good progress in the public service gender pay gap. It is coming down a lot quicker than in the private sector, but as I keep saying, there always will be more work to done 
more work to be done as long as the agenda pay gap exists. Now, fair pay agreements are another piece of the equity puzzle. For those of you who are a member of a union and covered by a collective employment agreement, like I was as a teacher and a principal, you'll be aware of the transparency which collective agreements provide. Fair pay agreements are another form of collective bargaining, but instead of covering a single worksite, they will cover an industry, for example, all cleaners. They'll set binding minimum terms and conditions across an occupational industry. And it's easy to see that fair pay agreements will help address women's low pay. Legislation is currently before select committee with the intention of it being enforced by 2020, the end of 2022. I am committed, and this is the big part of my work plan at this point in time, I am committed to the implementation of pay transparency. Women should not be paid less because they are women. Discriminatory pay practices can be hidden by a lack of transparency. The knowledge provided by pay transparency is an important step towards achieving great pay equity and closing gender and ethnic pay gaps. A lack of pay transparency can also mean that employees lack information to identify equal pay or pay equity issues, affecting their ability to make a claim. The Government recently welcomed the Education and Workforce Committee's briefing into pay transparency and agreed to investigate whether a pay transparency regime in New Zealand would be beneficial. Manatu Wahini and the Ministry of Business Innovation and Employment are currently planning a work programme to improve pay transparency in New Zealand. This is a really exciting step for me as Minister for Women and my colleague Minister Radhakrishnan, Associate Minister for Workplace Relations and Safety. I would also like to thank Mind the Gap and the Human Rights Commission for their work and drive for change on this issue. Working together will make change happen for women in Aotearoa. And maybe comedians might actually then know that they're on the same pay rates as each other if we're working in this area. The Women's Employment Action Plan includes an action to investigate financial disadvantage for women with a focus on women's retirement and KiwiSaver. The government is considering ways to enhance KiwiSaver to ensure that New Zealanders are better financially prepared for retirement. MB is leading this work with support from a cross-agency working group, which includes the Manatu Wahini. While there is no set time frame for this work, MB expects to provide initial advice later this year. Now, I um, recently spoke at a financial literacy conference and I talked about how um, my story with financial literacy started and I've always, um, I'm, I'm a bit like Michelle, I was always a bit of an impulse buyer as well um, but that doesn't happen so much these days but my journey started when I was at primary school and I uh, was saved with the post office savings bank and had the school banking every week and I was absolutely determined that my class was going to win the shield that went round the classrooms each week and so I became a saver from that point in time and it does worry me that uh, we don't have such and I know there's some individuals sitting in the audience now who are doing fantastic work in schools and in the financial literacy capability area but it does worry me that uh, we have not got that same level of financial literacy that's happening consistently across schools. And I, being a former educator, am strongly um, passionate about the fact that that's where financial literacy understanding starts and that we must have a consistent approach. And so I am committed to commissioning consideration of this in the curriculum refresh, which I have the oversight of. So my officials know that this is an area that I'm absolutely passionate about and are going away and doing that work. So I'm hoping that for some of you that are sitting in the audience that work in this area, that that can be a conversation that we continue on with because I believe that there is a confidence gap between men and women and improving the confidence and financial literacy of young women will have lifelong benefits for their financial freedom, self-empowerment and overall wellbeing, not to mention the financial implications for retirement. I was heartened to read of initiatives being taken by Z Energy, who announced on the 9th of August that the company would pay KiwiSaver during the entire parental leave period, including any unpaid period, and pay employees working part-time over 20 hours per week. The KiwiSaver contribution based on a full-time salary equivalent rather than their actual pro rata pay. 
Zed Energy is also going to provide financial literacy sessions to all Zed employees. And this is a wonderful example of working together, and by working together, we can take collective action to shift the dial for women. I recently met up with Jane and had a conversation exactly about this, and went back to have that conversation with my officials, and also, I know you've heard from um, Minister Clark, and I had that conversation with him as well, because I think there is so much that we can be thinking about that we can really make a really tangible difference to women in this area. But it's also about the important work that you are all doing. It's about action the government is taking to close the gender pay gap, gap and increase pay equity in Aotearoa New Zealand. Other work that still needs to be done includes increasing women's representation and leadership, reducing the amount of unpaid work that falls to women, and increasing access to social services such as childcare and transport to enable women to participate in paid work. And it is about my commitment to you through the work of Te Maheri Whai Mahi Wahine, the Women's Employment Action Plan. It is possible to make New Zealand a fairer, more equal place, and I'm totally committed to that outcome. Look, I know that actually on the scheme of things, we do sit quite well. When I did have that bilateral with um, the Japanese Prime Minister's advisor for women, we, they are envious of our position. But we cannot accept where many, many women are right now. We cannot accept, while a gender pay gap exists, that that is OK. There will be more work to do, and I am committed to that work while that gender pay gap exists. That is why the collective actions by organisations such as yourselves are so important. Together, we can close these gaps and correct these imbalances. I am committed to empowering all women, to building financial confidence and wellbeing. These actions will bring significant improvements to our communities. And I look forward to hearing about the outcomes of conference workshops and the exploration of what more we can do to shift the dial and where to from here. And I look forward to continuing the conversation about how we can make that difference together from many of you. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Mihi, Minister, we have a bunch of questions that are, that are coming through on Slido for you. Um, the first one is who in the world, not like who in the world, but like who in uh, globally, is doing better than us when it comes to the gender pay gap? What are those countries doing to help women and what could we learn from them? My guess is it's, it's Sweden. I was just going to say, it's the Scandinavian yeah. countries. <laughs> it's always um, Yeah, and, and actually I'm hoping to get there soon to have some bilaterals with them if I can't get there in person, we're setting up some um, with technology, but face-to-face -face is always better so that we can get that on the ground. Um, but it's again, it's, it's, it's the transparency, it's valuing, it's um, paying the, the parental leave. The parental leave entitlements are absolutely stunning in those countries. Yeah. So um, it's all of those things, and it's the collective of what we want to be doing and what we've already identified. My officials, uh, they work through it in that area all the time, and they're constantly having discussions and um, bilaterals with those their, their equivalent officials over there. So a lot of that you'll find in the Women's Employment Action Plan. Oh, great, okay. Yeah. There's this kind of weird attitude, isn't there, whenever we talk about these kinds of subjects where uh, people, and when I say people, I mean men, will say, um, <laughs> these are nice to have, but we can't afford it. Let's wait until the, uh, you know, inflation's lower, or um, the economy's on a better footing, or blah, 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 blah. But isn't it kind of true that all of these things help the economy function better? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But we've got to have the evidence to back that up too. And that's some of the work that, you know, it's unbelievable that in a lot of cases we don't have the evidence and we don't have the data yeah. and it hasn't been disaggregated out via gender. Uh, so that's one of the areas that I've been pushing into and saying, well, what 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 does the data show? Let's have a look at that. What does this mean? What will that mean going forward? And um, just as an example, I've been to a couple of meetings when I first came into this position, and um, there was data that was presented, and it 
didn't have that disaggregation of gender in it. And so I said, well, what about that? Oh, well, we've never done that before. And I said, well, I think we can start doing it now. So it's just having that evidence yeah. that we can then say this is the difference it can make. I also will say on that is that um, there's a lack of education out there too. You know, I've been into companies who will say to me, we don't have a gender pay gap. And I sort of sit there and sort of prosecute that a little bit more by saying, sort of digging in to see if they understand what a gender pay gap means, and they don't. So they think that they, they're they okay, but when it's kind of gently pointed out, it's a little bit of an uncomfortable space for them. And it's not because they haven't, they don't want that, you know, like they, they're not being naive deliberately around right, that. Right, Yeah, so there a is an education. A lot of people confuse the gender pay gap with pay equity. Yes, so if, you get, yeah. if you've got two people standing side by side of a, of a different yeah. gender and you're paying them the same, then yeah. you don't have a pay gap. But you do yeah. if you're paying men far more on average than you are paying yeah. women. So the Mind the Gap campaign wants mandatory reporting yeah. of pay gaps. Is that something the government is going to do? We are definitely investigating it. So we want to bring people with us. So we want to ensure that we've got that education part first. We're gathering the data, because I and we're doing that through um, various, we've, we've commissioned various data sources to come together, because we want to show the difference that it will make. There, there have been some countries in the world where, and the UK is one of them, where they've brought in a pay transparency regime and it actually brought the top down. Okay. We want it to go this way. Right, yeah, yeah. So yeah. we want to make certain that we're getting that right. I, look, I'm committed to it, and um, it was actually in the Education and Workforce Select Committee's briefing, it was one of the areas that they uh, suggested, it was one of the recommendations that they made, and we've committed to all of those recommendations in principle. It's just we've got to work through it to make certain that we're not having unintended consequences and we get the timing right on it. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. Um, here's a great question. Are you concerned that employers might shy away from employing women if they're forced into paying more than they might otherwise have? More full them, I'd say. Um, those are all considerations that we need to be having when we're going through that process. That's what I mean about unintended consequences. Right. So we need to make certain that we are not having unintended consequences there. But having said that, if they're already paying the men more anyway, um, there's, there's not going to be that issue, but if they're only employing them because they can employ yeah. them for less, they've got serious issues yeah. in their company. Yeah, who wants to work there? Yeah, who um, would want to work there? That it's, I'm very old, as I've mentioned, and, and I remember that argument from the 1970s when we were fighting for equal pay back then. You know, when a, yeah. a woman standing next to a man doing the same job was paid less because men, men needed to earn more money because they were the breadwinners and blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and one of the arguments against equal pay then was that, well, then employers just won't employ women if they have to pay them the same, and it didn't work out that way. No, no, and it doesn't work out that way. But I'll just go back to saying that unintended consequences that has happened in some jurisdictions is that it has brought that pay down. We don't want that to happen. We want it to all rise to that level. Yeah. Okay, yeah. understood. Uh, here's another question. A barrier for teachers in schools is often their own confidence and money journey. I'm terrible with money. How can I possibly teach others? That's a quote. How can we address that? Look, that is something that happens in a lot of areas, not just financial literacy and capability. Uh, I'm the first to admit that because I've worked in schools for so long. And so any of the changes that we're making at the moment in curriculum and across the different areas, I have said that we need to make certain that the supports go alongside the teachers to enable them to be able to teach any of this work. And this is a key area that we need to make certain that initial teacher education is cognizant of it because we've got out a step over many, many years in initial teacher education and we hear lots of times that young teachers, and when I say young, new teachers I should say, come out of the training and don't have that confidence to be able to teach because of their own capabilities so we need to help them and support them at that level but we also need to support our current teaching work 
workforce, and that's with professional learning development, but also the right resources. Too often, as a teacher and a principal, I got sent something and you will now do this, and we had no resources, and we were having to make that up on the spot. So I'm really convinced um, and determined that we will give the professional learning development and the resources, and there have been other areas that we've introduced this year that we can point to that we have done exactly that. Yeah, great. This is a really nice question. It's a big question. What would you say is the most important thing women need to understand about money? <laughs> I could go on forever there. Um, firstly, their own value. And they need to understand their own value. You know, many times um, women don't. And Michelle, your story at the beginning is a little bit of a, a um, topic around that, a story around that, because often we accept just who we are and so they need to understand that and they need to understand their value but financial literacy I just go back to the fact of understanding the difference that that gender pay gap means over time and what that means throughout their choices that they're able to make in life is really important you know I talked about that $888,000 understanding that alone will make a big difference to women. And I tell you my story, not that, that it wasn't until I said that out loud, um, not because it was uh, just a nice story, it's actually really important for women to understand that difference in a lifetime. And what can they do about that? So what changes can they make? And what can they do to lobby? Because it's, as I say, it's not just on them. It's lobbying government, because government policies need to change. It's being strong in the workforce. It's um, standing collectively together as women in society, because there's many, many men who want these changes too. Yeah. Um, and this is a great question too. Why can't we design the working week and structure to work better for women instead of having to fit into a working week designed for men in the 1950s? Totally agree. Absolutely, totally agree. Um, in fact, in the Women's Employment Action Plan, we do talk about flexibility of work. And, and look, I think this across all my portfolios, COVID has caused the greatest disruption that we have known in our lifetime. Uh, with disruption comes the greatest opportunity. And we have an opportunity now to have these discussions and to make these changes. And I know that there are companies who are making these changes. I know the public service are making these changes uh, because I work with public servants day in, day out, who are working in a way more flexible working situation. So it's getting that balance right. So I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. I, I want to ask all of these questions, but we've only got time for one more. I'm going to go with this one. What do you want to achieve in the next three years to close the gender pay gap? The work that we're doing in pay transparency is really important. So I do want to get through to a regime eventually with um, the country understanding it because I don't, and I think Mind the Gap are doing, as I said, amazing work in that area. And I encourage and have encouraged them to keep working there to raise that uh, awareness. So pay transparency is really important. Um, ensuring that women are valued in the workforce, ensuring that... Uh, we, that gap is coming down. At the moment, as I said, it has stagnated over the last few years. I want that gender pay gap coming down. And when I see that coming down, I'm going to be feeling a lot happier than what I'm feeling at the moment. As I said, we're not sitting too bad compared to other jurisdictions. Even Australia, we don't sit too bad. We, we measure our gender pay gap differently, but when you put it on the same level, we're actually doing a lot better than they are. And I have had a meeting recently with the Minister for Women, Katie Gallagher from Australia, and they want to learn from us, which I think is really good. But that doesn't mean to say we've got it. We need to keep going in this area. I want to see women valued for who they are and what they bring to the workforce. Minister, thank you so much. Another round of applause, please. Thank for you. Minister Jan